Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. It is good to have you all here with us, uh, either in person or watching online. Uh, it's good to have you here. So uh, today we have a couple special things happening. One, of course, is we're going to be honoring our high school graduates near the end of the service. So uh, those who are here with us, so uh, thank you all for coming for that. Um, another thing uh, that's a uh, conclusion of sorts is this is our last Sunday in our reading through the Bible 40 weeks. So uh, this, uh, we get to read Revelation. We're going to read the last, uh, well, second to last and last chapter of, the, of Scripture in Revelation chapters uh, 20, 21, and a little bit of 22. Uh, and this is exciting too because it rarely happens. In the reading, it actually says fire and brimstone at one point. So... Yeah, so get, it, get ready for that. It's going to be fun. It's going to be exciting. So, uh, but actually, it's, it's this beautiful picture, this beautiful picture of the promised end, the new creation the, of judgment, yes, and resurrection, uh, and the life without struggle, without sin, uh, which lasts eternally. So, some good things to look forward to. Uh, if this is your first time with us, or if you haven't been with us in a while, we commune uh, using little empty cups. And so whether you're communing in your pew or up front, um, you'll need one of those uh, little empty cups to receive the wine or the grape juice in. So make sure you have one of those if you don't already. Also, there are uh, prayer cards in your pews. Uh, and uh, if you have a prayer concern that you would like to be shared during the uh, uh, prayers of the people later in the service, whether it's a thanksgiving or a request, uh, please fill one of those out, and then after the prayer of the day, we'll pass those to the aisles, and the ushers will collect them and bring them forward so that I can use those during the uh, prayers of the people. And uh, on that note, uh, just a special prayer request that I want you to be holding. Uh, Greg Nelson has been in the hospital uh, for uh, uh, several days and is in Everett currently receiving dialysis. He's had some um, pretty major issues with uh, reacting probably to an antibiotic and some other issues uh, related to infection. So please hold uh, Greg and Marie uh, in particular uh, in prayer uh, as uh, for healing and that he comes out of this okay. Um, I think that's all of the notes that I have for you. So I'm going to invite you now to take a moment to... Uh, Breathe out all of the uh, worries that you've been carrying, all of the anxieties of the week, the month, uh, the year, uh, to let those go for the time being and to prepare yourself to hear the, what the Holy Spirit has for you. And I invite you to do that as we hear our prelude.
We begin our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the aid of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that, attentive to your word, we may confess our sins, receive your forgiveness, and grow in the fullness of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done, things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare unto you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Let us pray. God of resurrection, you comfort us in our sufferings with promises of the blessed end. Make for us. Make us trust completely in your promise so that we live fearless and fruitful lives here and now as we wait for the fulfillment of your promise through Jesus Christ, the Lamb. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The text this morning comes from Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 11, and uh, chapter 21, verses 14. The introduction. The last few chapters of Revelation give a highly symbolic description of the last judgment and the resurrected life. They describe a new creation where everything evil and deadly has been done away with, and all of the people live continually in the presence of God. The reading begins. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with twelve gates, and with twelve angels at the gates. On the gates were written the, name, the names of the twelve tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. Our psalm is from Psalm 92. Psalm 92. 
It is good thing to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. On the psaltery and on the lyre, and to the melody of the heart. For you have made me glad by your acts, O Lord, and I shout for joy because of the works of your hands. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree, and shall spread abroad like a cedar of Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bear fruit in old age. They shall be green and succulent, that they may show how upright the Lord is, my rock in whom there is no injustice. Our preaching text from Revelation continues. Uh, I'm going to invite you to stay seated because it's long. Uh, But our preaching text from Revelation continues. But before that, there is uh, 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 an introduction from the book of Exodus, which seems a little strange, but I think if you pay attention, you might notice some parallels here. Uh, This is uh, Moses, or the time of Moses in the wilderness with Israel. They fashioned the breastpiece, that is the breastpiece for the priest, the work of a skilled craftsman. They made it like the ephod of gold and of blue, purple and scarlet yarn and of finely twisted linen. It was a square, a span long and a span wide and folded double. Then they mounted four rows of precious stones on it. The first row was carnelian, chrysolite and beryl. The second row was turquoise, lapis lazuli and emerald. The third row was jacinth, agate and amethyst. The fourth row was topaz, onyx and jasper. They were mounted in gold filigree settings. There were 12 stones, one for each of the names of the sons of Israel, each engraved like a seal with the name of one of the 12 tribes. The reading from Revelation continues. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. The city was laid out like a square, as long as it is wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as wide and high as it is long. The angel measured the wall using human measurement, and it was 144 cubits thick. The wall was made of jasper, the city of pure gold, as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth ruby, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth turquoise, the eleventh jacinth and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of gold, as pure as transparent glass. I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, The kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and His servants will serve Him. They will see His face. His name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. I'd like to invite children forward for children's sermon. Good.
Good morning. How is everybody? So, how many thumbs? Thumbs up? Two thumbs up? Two thumbs down? Two thumbs middle? I've got lots of thumbs ups and sideways. Two, maybe. I don't know how we do the math on thumbs. Yeah, but maybe. Maybe two thumbs middle equals one thumb up. I'm not sure. All right, I've got a question for you. Oh, and shaking thumbs, of course. I've got a question for you. Uh, we have uh, a special day today. Who knows what day it is today? Father's Day. That's right. It is Father's Day today. Who do we celebrate on Father's Day? Fathers. Fathers? Yeah. Any, any, uh, any disagreement over here? Or any additions? And grandfathers? Father's fathers or mother's fathers? Yeah. And yeah? Yes. Me. I'm your father. That's true. Yeah. And yeah? And great, great grandfathers, as many uh, generations back as we can go. That's all right. Did you have an addition? I am God our Father. Excellent. You've basically got my sermon already. So uh, today's Father's Day, and Father's Day is especially a day that we celebrate our fathers, our earthly fathers, the fathers who, uh, who we know, who have uh, raised us, or sometimes they're maybe not literally our fathers. Some families are, are different. We have other people who act as our fathers. Sometimes that's how God provides for us. But one of the things that we especially want to celebrate on a day like today is our Father who is in heaven. So we say this in the Lord's Prayer, right? We say, our Father who art in heaven, right? We say this every time. Do you ever think about what it means to call God our Father? Have you ever thought about that? Maybe you say it so often you never really think about what that means. But uh, what sorts of things are fathers supposed to do? What are some things that fathers are supposed to do? Go and raise your hand. Don't just yell them out. Yeah. Eliana, what's something that fathers are supposed to do? Take care of us? Make us safe? Keep us safe? Yeah? Not let us die. So keep us safe. Make us, keep us alive. Yeah? Forgive us. Good. Hayden, did you have something? They, exactly. Give us food. That's right. Feed us. Yeah? And feed us, that's exactly right. Yep, that's a very important thing. So all of these things and more, we could think of lots of other things. Like what about love us? Our Father's supposed to love us? Yeah. Our Father's supposed to teach us? Yeah. Our Father's supposed to, to guide us, maybe tell us when we're wrong and when we're right, both? Yeah. Well, God, our Father, does all these things for us. God, our Father, loves us, cares for us, feeds us. You know, if you, how many of you have eaten today? Did you know that God gave you that food? Yeah? And God used the hands of lots of other people to do it. The people who grew it, the people who packaged it, the people who carried it to where you are, your uh, parents or whoever it was that bought it uh, or maybe prepared it for you. God used all of those people to feed you. God feeds you, loves us, forgives us, and promises to be with us and keep us safe forever. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, I think that's pretty cool. So let's pray to our Father and thank God for being such a good Father to us. Dear God, we thank you for loving us, forgiving us, caring for us, and giving us uh, people to be our fathers here on earth as well. Keep watching out for us and help us to trust you always. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for coming up. You can head on back to your seats now. Beloved people of God, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, the book of Revelation, if you didn't already know this, is a doozy. Did you notice that in the reading? We didn't even read the most exciting parts of Revelation, at least not the most uh, fantastical parts, the most uh, confusing parts sometimes. In fact, if you read the book of Revelation, there's after a uh, first few chapters where there's some letters written to uh, particular churches of that time, there's this long section that makes, uh, takes the bulk of Revelation, which is uh, this long uh, account of this vision that John, the author of Revelation, has seen. And the vision is wild. I mean, just imagine all sorts of wild things you can see. There's, there's dragons in the visions. There's angels fighting each other. There's bowls of plagues being dumped onto the earth. There's wars. There's the four horsemen of the apocalypse. We've heard of that. All of these things are, are in this section of, of Revelation, the bulk of Revelation. It's, it's chaos. It's 
chaos in the way it's written. It's chaos in what it's portraying. And it's even chaos in trying to make sense of what all these things stand for. Uh, Go online, you can find a hundred different explanations for exactly what every little symbol or image in the book of Revelation represents, and I can't even stand here and tell you exactly what all of them are, or even most of them. It's been chaos for many chapters in the book of Revelation by the time we get to our reading, and then suddenly the chaos is brought to an end. There's, at the beginning of our reading, something changes. I saw, John writes, a great white throne, and the one who was seated on it, and the earth and the heaven, that is all that exists, fled from his presence, though no place could be found for them. Into this chaos comes God, and God sitting on a throne a throne of judgment. We might, in more modern terms, imagine a judge's bench. In comes God seated on this bench, and suddenly the chaos stops. Everyone, everything is trying to evade this judge's gaze, and it cannot. Suddenly, everything is laid to rest. Everything comes to meet its maker. I saw the dead, John goes on, great and small, before the throne, and books were opened. Now, we know something about uh, what happens, right? We know what it means to throw the book at somebody. We know something about uh, this idea of of the law bringing its full uh, force against those who find themselves in front of a judge in a courtroom. We can imagine what comes next, that this judge now having all the dead before him is going to execute the full judgment of the law. In fact, the books are opened, many books. As it goes on, it seems like these books have a record of everything everyone ever did, all laid out before them. We think we know what's going to come. It continues. Another book was opened, the book of life. Pay attention to that. We have the books and we have another book being opened. And then the dead were judged according to what, uh, to what had been done as recorded in the books. This makes sense. And then the sea gave up the dead that was in it. So the sea, this force of, of chaos, this deadly and frightening thing has given up its dead. Then, uh, and each of them were judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades had given up the dead that were in them, and they were judged according to what they had done. And then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. Now, that seems a little strange, doesn't it? Here is the judgment of all creation. Here is the great courtroom scene where all the dead have their works laid out before them who are being judged. There is the lake of fire. We could think of it as uh, the, 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 uh, the, the consequences which come from the violation of the law, right? This is destruction. This is the second death, as it's called. And who goes in there? Death goes in there. Hades, that is the realm of the dead, the underworld, the power of death, goes in there. And then anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Now, there's something a little surprising here because we have sort of two things happening at the same time. There's this books of judgment of everything everybody's ever done, and it's all laid out. There's no escape. Everything is made clear. And then those books are shut, and there is nothing more done with them. And this other book, the book that is the Lamb's book of life, the book which has the Lamb's, the names which the Lamb, that is Jesus Christ, has written in it, it is opened, and a roll call is taken. And all the names that are found in this book have nothing to do with that judgment. There's two judgments happening here, 
two strange things happening here as God intervenes in the chaos of creation and brings it to its summation. And now a new creation comes. Now, when we read texts like this, I know the things that stick in our head are lake of fire. The things that stick in our head are judge and judgment. The things that stick in our head are fire and brimstone, or as this translation a little disappointingly says, fire, uh, lake of fiery sulfur. Fire and brimstone is just more fun to say. Uh, that's what sticks with us. But notice how many words that was. I don't know, 10, 20? And how many words the rest of this text is. Listen to the promise here, which greatly, greatly overwhelms the condemnation. There was a new heaven and a new earth, a new creation for the first heaven and the first earth, with all of their chaos, with all of their destruction, with their sin, with their death, they had passed away, thrown into the lake of fire. There was no longer any sea that is any more source of chaos and fright. Remember, this is highly symbolic. I saw a holy city, a new Jerusalem, descending from the heavens like a bride prepared for her husband, her husband who is, as we come to find out, the Lamb, Jesus Himself. As the description of the city goes on, it's remarkable, it's wondrous. This angel goes to measure it, 12,000 stadia long and wide and tall. Anybody know how, long, how far 12,000 stadia is? Any guesses? Around 1,400 miles, 1,400 miles this city is. This city is, well, you do the math. You can put it on a but it's this long and wide and tall. This is bigger than anything you can possibly imagine. How, many, uh, how much room is there in this city? Oh, there is clearly room enough for all. There's an impressive wall that goes around the city, but the wall sort of comically is dwarfed by the size of the city, 144 cubits. That's about 75 yards or so. It's a big wall, but compared to that city, it doesn't look like much. In fact, you get the sense that the city doesn't really need a wall. The wall is porous. There's 12 gates on it, three gates in every direction. The gates never close. Why do you even have gates, you wonder? There's no need for them. There's no time to close them. There's no source of, of frightening darkness. There's no source of, uh, of, of night which people need to pre be protected from because God has dwelled among them. Did you hear that promise? God will dwell with them. They will be His people. God Himself will be with them and be their God. God will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old things have passed away. I am making everything new, He says on the throne. We talk about judgment. We talk about the final days, the last days, the end of everything. But even in Revelation, the judgment is just a prelude to the creation which follows. The judgment, the setting aside of the chaos and the death and the evil is just a prelude for the life of peace, of prosperity of joy in God's presence. The judgment in which the whole creation was fleeing from the face of God has given way to God's dwelling among the people, people who are no longer fleeing from their God, but flocking. The kings of the nations, there's nations outside this city as big as it is, the kings of the nations bring their glory to it. They stream into it. Out of this city streams the water of the river of life, the tree of life. Remember this image to the uh, allusion to the garden at the beginning, the, the tree of life which was in the center of the garden. Now there are two trees of life, at least, on both sides of this river. And the tree of life is bearing fruit in every season. Every month of the year, a new fruit comes off of this tree. 
There is enough food for everyone. They have no need to work for their food. The garden in this city is simply providing it. New fruit every month of the year. Imagine that. The leaves of the tree are useful. That's unusual. Usually you just want the tree for its fruit, right? The leaves of this tree are useful. They heal the nations. All have access to this now. This is a wonderful promise, especially to Christians to whom maybe John is writing, who are living in a chaotic and tumultuous time, a time when it's difficult to tell who's doing what and who's in the right and whether the things that we've taken for granted for so long will be there for us tomorrow or the next month or the next year. The people to whom uh, this letter is written are in fear. They're in fear for their lives and their livelihoods, for their future and their children. They don't have much to hold on to in this world. We can relate to some of that. We can relate to being in chaotic and challenging times. We can relate to not knowing whether the things we have held dear will hold up for another year or two or ten. We can relate to leaving behind things that have comforted us, even if they haven't always done a great job, and going into an unknown future. Uh, uncertain times, new callings, experiences, new things to face. We can relate to the people to whom this letter is written. And the promise to them, to us, is the same. This chaos will pass. This injustice will be brought to an end. This death will be no more. This fleeing from the presence of God will be overcome by joy and life in God's presence. Now, there's some pieces in here, of course, that still cause us to worry, to wonder. Probably the one that's the strongest is that uh, list of those uh, who uh, are not found in the city. The cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur or the lake of fire and brimstone. This is the second death. And we hear that. We hear this wonderful promise and this beautiful, poetic, symbolic description of what life with God is like. And we say, but wait, I'm cowardly sometimes. I don't always believe as I should. I do things I should not. I've never actually murdered anyone, perhaps, but according to Jesus, I've had hate in my heart, which makes me guilty of this commandment. Sexually immoral, that applies as well. Practicing magic arts, maybe not so overtly, but we do many things thinking we can curry God's favor. Idolaters, those who put their trust in things that are not God. Liars, how many of us have never told a lie? And we say, so what does this mean for me? Where will my place be? be. When God opens those books to judge my life, what sorts of things will God have to say? Well, the answer is found not in those books, but in the other book, the Lamb's book of life, the the book that operates only by the promise of Jesus Christ, that whoever's name He writes, that name counts. And the promise then of there being no liars, no cowardly, no unbelieving, no vile, and so on, is that you will no longer be that any longer. The you that is the cowardly, the unbelieving, the immoral, the practicing magic, the idolaters, the liars, 
that you will come to an end. That you will be consigned to destruction. And no longer will you have to wrestle with that. For the you who is the child of God, the you who is Christ's beloved, the you who trusts in Him completely and perfectly, the you who loves as you ought to, the you who no longer has any need for deception or hiding, the you who fears nothing but the God who loves you deeply, that you will continue forever. This new life, this resurrected life and this new creation will not simply be a continuing of life like now where we struggle against ourselves, against the world around us, against the forces of sin and death. It will be a life in which those things, even our own sinful selves, have been overcome and done away with. A life where we live solely out of the joy of our names being written in the book of the Lamb. And if you're still not sure, then let me do something for you. Let me deliver you a promise that comes from the Lamb Himself. A promise that has been making its way throughout the world for generations, for millennia. A promise that writes your name in that book. And here is that promise. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Lamb who was slain, your sins are forgiven. You belong to Him now and forever. Your name is in that book of life. And when that last day comes and those books are opened and whatever you have done, the good and the bad, the things you did not know you did for the good and for the bad, when those are all laid out in front of you, you can say without fear, yes, Lord, that is who I was. That is who I have been. But my name is written in that book of life. And because of that, everything that belongs to Christ is yours. And the Lamb of God, the husband of the bride, the bride who is the city, the new city, the new Jerusalem, the bride who is you and me, we will be taken forever into that life of love, of joy, of justice, of things being exactly as they should. And as we await that day, on the strength of that hope, the strength of that promise, we live without fear here in this chaotic world full of evil and death and sin, eagerly waiting for God to make things right and yet living in love and freedom as we await the fulfillment of that promise. Amen.
public Christian faith in the words of the, Ninth, of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Called by the Holy Spirit, we come before God to pray for our communities, ourselves, and our world. Alpha and Omega, you are with us from first to last. Nourish your faithful people through gifts of word and worship. Guide the church in listening to and sharing your promise of mercy for this time and place. Merciful God, Creator of old and new, the skies declare your glory in the morning and your faithfulness at night. Sustain us in rhythms of creation for as long as you have given us in this life. Give us hope for the future you have promised that we may be sustained and energized here and now. Merciful God. God of justice and judgment, you see all that is done and you know the inner thoughts of all. Act here and now on behalf of those who are wronged, that the effects of sin and injustice are restrained. Reveal to us your error and bring us <clears throat> to repentance so that we may learn to trust in your mercy. Merciful God. God of resurrection, <clears throat> tend to all who journey by faith and who wait with patience for the fulfillment of your healing promises. Grant perseverance to people doing physical and occupational therapy, people living with mobility concerns, and people facing chronic pain. Merciful God, as you have loved us, <clears throat> so let us love one another. Empower fathers, stepfathers, grandfathers, adopted fathers, and chosen fathers to embody this gift of love for their children. Where these relationships are strained or broken, bring your comfort and your peace. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we thank you for your goodness and ask you to supply what we need. Receive now the thanksgivings and concern of those who have gathered before you now. We lift up the family of Glenn Rickert. We pray for Greg Nelson. We pray for all who, uh, all who have lost their fathers. Merciful God, God, receive our prayer. Receive our prayers, O God, and come quickly to our aid through the power of the Spirit and love of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. And also with you. Peace, John. Peace.
Please stand. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Use us and what we have gathered in feeding the world with your love through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We live unto the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed The night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and he broke it and he gave thanks and he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to his, for all to drink saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. When you come forward uh, for communion, there is uh, uh, bread and uh, gluten-free wafers available for those who need gluten-free. There is white wine in the plain chalice and red wine in the blue chalice. Uh, if you require the, the grape juice instead of the wine, cover your cup when I come by with the wine um, so that I know not to give you any. Uh, if you would re prefer to receive a blessing instead, you're welcome to uh, signify that by this, uh, and that is all right as well. And if you uh, want to receive communion in your pews, because coming forward is difficult, we'll bring it to you after uh, everyone else has come forward. We uh, invite all who have been baptized into the faith of Jesus Christ to come and receive him for the forgiveness of sins here and now.
the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace now and forever. Amen. Amen. I have a few announcements, and then I'm going to welcome our graduates forward. Uh, first announcement is there's going to be no Bible, Monday Bible study tomorrow. Um, in fact, we're going to be, then I'm on vacation for a couple of weeks, so we're going to be off for a bit, and we will come back later in the summer, and I'll let you know when that is because I don't know right off the top of my head. So no Monday uh, evening Bible study tomorrow. Just be aware of that. Uh, other announcement that we need to have out is a uh, semi-annual meeting is next Sunday following uh, worship. And then there's uh, puzzles, cards, and games day following that in the fellowship hall. So uh, stick around for all of it. Or, you know, if you want to stick around but uh, you're not able to vote in a, in a business meeting. Now, if you can vote, you better stick around for the meeting. But if you're not able to, you can go to the fellowship hall, and that's okay. Um, and then uh, also, uh, this uh, Wednesday is a pretty big day for uh, Vic and Judy Jensen. I don't know if they saw their names or in the announcement sheet, uh, but their 60th wedding anniversary is coming up. So congratulations to that. Now, I'd like to invite our uh, high school graduates forward. Come on up. Don't be shy. And I'd also like to uh, invite Rebecca Geary forward because Rebecca graduated from SVC on Thursday uh, with an Associates in Arts. So, um, oh, I just have to do this. So, on uh, whenever the award night was, last week sometime, I need to stand between you two. Uh, these two I was presenting a scholarship to, and I got to stand and be short, which I never get to be, and it was just a fun way to have a picture. So uh, anyway, so, uh, uh, so uh, as we're honoring our, our graduates here, so we have Maddox and, uh, Maddox and Jonathan, who both, and Maiden, who are all three graduating from Burlington Edison, and of course we have Abby Ormsby, who's graduating from Bellingham High School, and then there's a couple others uh, connected with uh, the congregation who aren't able to be here this morning, Dakota Wyman and, Mar and Marin Jensen, um, graduating from Burlington Edison and from Anacortes High School. So it's a big deal to graduate, and I know you've had all sorts of um, uh, times and questions of what are you doing next, and I'm not going to ask you or make you say any of those right now. Um, but what we want to do is we want to be able to uh, recognize your achievement and also uh, give our support and prayer as you step into whatever comes next. So this is what we're going to do. I'm going to invite you to sort of make a semi -cert well, no, actually, I'm going to invite you to, uh, to kneel up by the altar, if that's okay, at the altar rail. And I'm going to invite everybody in the congregation to get up and come forward. And if, you, uh, if getting up is tricky, stay in your seat, that's okay. And we're going to lay hands on these people. And if you can't reach them, then you reach somebody who reaches them. So come on, get up. And bring your bulletin because there's a prayer in the bulletin we'll say. Or stand next to somebody who remembered to bring their bulletin. Yeah. And if you are uh, related to one of them, you get priority to be close to them, I think. And once you get as close as you can get, you just put your hand on the person in front of you or hold your hand out towards that person. That's okay, too. All right. And please pray with me the prayer that starts with, O oh God. O oh God, you have called your servants of ventures of which we cannot see the ending by paths as yet untrodden through perils unknown. Give these graduates faith to go out with good courage not knowing where they go, but only that your hand is leading them and your love supporting them. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody, for coming and laying on hands uh, of these graduates as we send them into whatever the next step is. And as you make your way back to your seats... Oh, and graduates, I have, we have gifts for you that I was supposed to give you and I forgot about. So, 
These gifts that we have are these little prayer cloths um, that you can take with you. Maddox, here's yours. And there's a little card with them. So these are, these are here for you. Um, make sure you get one from me. Maiden. Did you want to say anything else about them? Well, I just want to say um, our personal Abigail. ministry makes these for you kids especially. Jonathan. And we made you a little one because uh, we don't know what your situation is. If you're in a dorm, if you're still at home, if you're in an apartment, wherever you are, put in a place that you see every day. I one time suggested put it in your underwear drawer, but that was for that All right, you can all head to your seats now. I'm supposed to do that before we all prayed for you, but that's all right. All right, now that you all sat down, time to stand up again uh, and receive God's blessing. The peace of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless your hearts and your minds and keep them in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. I forgot a very important announcement. So here I am giving you this very important announcement. As many of you may know, uh, the school that we support in Tanzania, the Dan Craig School, sent uh, a few students to uh, another Lutheran high school in Tanzania that's supported by the Eastern Washington, well, Northwest Intermountain Synod, they're called now, but Eastern Washington Lutherans on that side of the mountains. And there's a few of the students, three of them, who are requesting support for tuition fees. So if you are interested in uh, maybe partnering with others to sponsor, I've got three info sheets. They look just like this. They're sitting on that desk in the back, and there's a place to write your name if you're interested, and if there's an amount that you're interested in supporting, so we can sort of figure that out. But you don't need to fill that out, just the name. But just take a look at these. So there's three of them, uh, and they are, they're looking for support. There's videos that, they, that they've recorded with Pastor Moses and the, the QR code. Uh, if you know how to do a QR code, you can watch the video, or you can type the your it's in here too. But I just want to draw your attention to those. Those are in the back, and we just want to see what sort of interest there is as far as helping these uh, kids be able to uh, pay their tuition at this school. That was the announcement I forgot. It was an important one, and now Mark will actually send you out. Go in peace. You are the body of Christ.